Yes, Lauren. Uh, oh, it's just chat. Do you want me to sh share my screen now? Uh, I'll go into it right now. So okay. you guys are live. Okay. You need to let people in or? No, no. YouTube is a free. It's, it's streaming. Okay. So I've lost my screen, just so you know. All right, chat should be back. Okay. Hi, everybody. So far, there is 11 viewers. Lois, I've lost my screen. Hi, photographers. Welcome. We're just starting. We're going to be waiting a few more minutes until we reach 1 o'clock before we start. Today, we're broadcasting live from the San Diego Fairgrounds, home of this year's Homegrown Fun. So I'm Lois Fong Sakai, and next to me is Amatho Parasua. Hello. And we are the photo coordinators of the San Diego County Fair's International Exhibition of Photography. And unfortunately, due to the pandemic, we don't have a competition this year, but we're trying to still bring educational opportunities to everybody. So we are going to be chatting. So please pop in and say hello. Let us know your name and where you're streaming from. And in addition to this workshop, we have several other workshops that are going to be coming up over the next month. So the San Diego County Fair is going to be running until July 4th. If you're able to come on in, we'd love to see you here at the fairgrounds. There's great fair food and a lot of activities. There's make and takes. We're going to have the Ferris wheel and the merry-go-round going. But upcoming photo events on June 26th, we're going to have a photo shootout. We're actually two photo shootouts here at the fairgrounds in the afternoon. So it's free to enter with ticket purchase. So just get your ticket online and sign up early is where we can only have a limited number of photographers participate. And we are gonna have prizes for the first place winners and ribbons for first through third place winners. On July 3rd, we have another online workshop. It's gonna be image review. That's gonna be from seven to 9 p.m. And if you have an image that you'd like to enter, um, that's gonna be, you can email that to us in advance at sdfairphoto at gmail.com. We'll provide that information on our Facebook pages and to clubs later also. And then on July 3rd, we have another afternoon of two photo workshops, or not workshops, they're shootouts here at the fairgrounds also. So if you're interested, come on in. We'd love to see you. So it looks like we're at one o'clock now, and I'll go ahead and just introduce myself again real quickly. I'm Lois Fong Sakai. We've got Amethel Parasawa. Hello. And we're broadcasting live from the San Diego County Fair's Homegrown Fun. So if you're just logging on right now, please do feel free to let us know via chat what your name is and where you're coming from. So. For our very first workshop today, we've never done online workshops before. We are pleased to have award-winning photographer and judge for our very own competition, Monica Royal. She's gonna be speaking on the psychology of color. Monica, take it away. Thank you, ladies. Okay, share my screen now, right? Yes, ma'am. Probably should have been in share screen the whole time. That's okay. Well, I'm sad that the fair is not in person, but I'm ecstatic that the two of you and the powers of be behind you, you know, really put your heads together and put the muscle into it to bring us this virtual experience. Because even though we're all mostly finished with virtual, it's still the thing that keeps it from being nothing, right? We'd be, if we didn't have this, we'd have nothing. So thank you for having me. I'm really excited to talk about color. It's everything to me in my artwork. And I've spent years developing, developing, get it? Developing um, and learning about color theory. I didn't develop color theory. I just learned about it, but I apply it. And it's, well, that's where we're gonna talk about this so that you can see the value in it because it's really all about control. 
So I have a tendency to get excited and ahead of myself. So let's back up. That's me on the screen. That's where you can find me. These are the people that help me go where I go and spread the love. Tamron and Miller's. They gave us presents today, like a couple hundred dollars worth of presents. So I'm really looking forward to sharing those with you. Did we do logistics about questions and stuff like that? Did you ladies talk about that? No, we haven't yet. If you have any questions or comments, please feel free to put them in chat via the YouTube channel and we'll be collecting those and then presenting them to Monica to answer. But only positive comments, argumentative ones, email me directly. <laughs> <laughs> it totally happens. You were right. I don't know everything. I didn't invent photography or color. I just have lots of opinions. So we'll keep it positive. Definitely like lots of questions, especially for webinar view, which is what this is. So I have no faces, but I have Lois and Amethyl. And every now and again, they're going to look up and giving me, give me loving, long loving glances, right? <laughs> or thumbs up. Okay, let's jump in, let's start at the beginning. Power of color. I'm not sure that you think of knowing about color as having power. And as artists, as photographers, it is a tool in our arsenal that is invaluable. Of course, we have things like composition and I mean, the basic subject matter, what you photograph, also has power. Photographing a you know, babbling brook is wonderful. If you photograph an eight-legged hairy thing and you show it to me, that's a power I want nothing to do with because that's terrifying. So subject matter choice has a lot of power, but color as a tool of design is immensely powerful. And if you want to control your viewer's experience, then understanding color and how it affects people um, will give you that power. Now, I'm gonna say that phrase a lot, your viewer's experience. You also get to control that. So if you're a photographer out there and you've shown your work and you get feedback that you don't understand, then hopefully this will be able to answer a few of those questions. I also use this phrase, market research, meaning if you take one of your images and you show it to 10 people, what's the majority of the feedback? Do they like it, not like it, react? I do a thing in my own personal life, for real, uh, where I'll make an image and then I'll show it to, well, my partner who's, you know, I, I ruined her now because she knows too much about photography. But then I'll just show it to friends who have no photographic knowledge or training or whatever. And I'll just say, okay, I'm gonna turn on the computer and give me your honest response. And it comes up and if they go, well, then I'm done. I already know that that's not going anywhere because there's zero wow factor for an untrained photographer. So if it comes up and they're like, oh, well, that's a different thing. And then, whoa, that's a different thing, right? But there's a lot that can be garnered in terms of the effectiveness of your photography based on the average viewer's response. It doesn't make them right or wrong. It just gives you information. Most of us are pretty familiar with the traditional color wheel, right? Red, yellow, blue. But they control, or hmm, not control, they, you control. They hmm, dictates too strong influence. They influence emotional response. So if you have to photograph a scary, creepy black thing that crawls that I hate, and in post-production you make it pink, that's gonna make me feel a little bit better, because normally, they're a yucky color. So I'm gonna go through many of the main colors and I'm gonna talk about um, how I use them, how I feel they impact people in general. Then we're gonna talk about that, color harmonies. So how to use all the colors together. And I, I love, of course I love talking about photography this way, but I also really, really love talking about um, graphics and ad campaigns and stuff like that, and which ones apply the rules of good color harmony, and some I just can't understand why they make the choices that they make. But at the beginning, raise your hand, as if I can see you, if you've ever tried to paint your house, and you come home and you have paint swatches of 
of colors and you put them on your wall and you look and oh great i love that color then you go buy paint and you paint the wall and then you say oh i thought that was blue and now it looks green what's up so then you go back to the paint store and you buy something else oh i'm gonna go neutral gray okay and you paint the wall gray then the next day you wake up and you're like ah oh, that's blue what's going on well Color is a word that everybody uses, um, lay, layman's terms, but really what you're talking about is hue. Now, I don't expect in your life to be like, I want to paint a certain hue in my house because I know that'd be, that would be weird. But as a scientist, you need to understand, well, I mean, art is science, right? You need to science your art a little bit to have that control that we talked about. So hue. What is hue? Well, hue is made like tints, shades, and tones. They control the hue. So the hue is what you know to be color, that word, in its purest form. So without any additives. And if you're saying, well, what's an additive? Well, when you add white to a hue, you're going to change its value. So you're going to make it a different hue. <laughs> If you add black to something, you're gonna shade it. So it's going to become darker. So you can see the circles on the, on the right. It starts, I'm gonna go back one. So it starts in its most pure form, that's the hue. So in this case, it's red. When you add white, now you're creating shades of pink, okay? The opposite, upper red dot, hue, it's the most pure form of that color. And then, you shade it by adding black and it changes that shade, that value. Toning is very simple, it's adding gray. Now, if you're sitting there saying, I don't know why we have to do this, this is photography, not painting, who cares, what's the point? Well, you need to hang in there and trust me because it's going to become very clear because you're gonna have a homework assignment, which is to go and look at your own portfolio and try to figure out what your color choices are and your color harmonies. But like I said, I get excited and get ahead of myself. So we'll get there. Put questions in the chat. Don't hesitate. I'm not super tangential. So if we stop to ask, answer a question, to ask, if we stop to answer a question, we'll get right back on track. I promise. So brightness. The brightness, it's the relative lightness and darkness. And it's different than saturation. I'm going to go back and forth here because saturation is the intensity of the hue from the gray. So it's different than brightness, almost said lightness, brightness and lightness kind of interchangeable. These are important to understand, especially in digital, right? It's a super pet peeve for landscape photographers. Don't oversaturate. Saturation is a tool that's meant to be used gently. Oversaturating colors is going to give you a sense of falseness. Um, I mean, you can pump them up, I get that. And, and I do that too in my own fine art photography, but just be gentle with it. It's okay to back off a little bit. So Monica, are you saying that the sliders for saturation go both ways? Oh yes, a hundred percent, a hundred percent. There are, Yes, <laughs> I'm trying to think, should I wait till I get there in the presentation? Yes, you can desaturate your colors um, by changing the lightness value of them, or you can change the actual hue by adding white, which will sometimes give an appearance of desaturation. Now understand this program, it scratches the surface, right? You can take, I mean, you can take a semester study about color and color theory, and color in photography or color in just portrait or just landscape photography. So yeah, we're gonna scratch the surface, but that's a good question. Do we have any others while we're at a moment's pause? Emma, though, anything else related to this at this time? I'm curious, Monica, if there are, <clears throat> or maybe this is too soon to ask this, if there are colors that you gravitate to as a photographer. Yes. Excellent question. And there's one color that I gravitate to the least. That's a skill testing question for later. 
So we'll just keep going. Typically, the primary colors are separated into these two sections, right? And this is something that, you know, the average person knows and can speak to, I think, with some authority. Oh, hey, I really like the warm tones. I like the cool tones. Remember that whole phase we went through, I don't know, what, 15 years ago, we were typing our clothing by um, um, season, right? I'm a winter, I'm a summer, I'm a fall. That has to do with warm and cool colors. Color harmonies, like I said in the beginning, it's how you put them all together. So color schemes are the names of the different kinds of color harmonies that you put together. And the first one is monochromatic. So what's monochromatic? Well, it's not just, people use the term monochromatic when they talk about black and white, and that's really not super accurate because um, monochromatic colors are colors on the color wheel, but different shades and tints of the same color. So here's this turquoisey green. If you look on the graph on the left, so it starts in its purest form over there on the right, and then the graph on the left is, is tinting on one side and shading on the other, which changes the value. If you've been to any of my other programs, well, so many of them are on visual design and value is one of the elements of art that um, is extremely useful to know. So it goes hand in hand with your color harmonies and choosing your color schemes because altering the value of the color scheme will actually change its appearance and it will then change the viewer's experience, which is ultimately what you want to be able to control. So that's what we're doing is trying to learn enough so that we can control or predict the viewer's experience. Simple, purple. All right, so let's talk about pink for starters. The color pink, <laughs> I wish we were live because if we were live, I'd be like, so what do you know about the color pink? Um, let me put on my spectacles for a second. Oh, hello, I see him and thaw, hi. Well, I mean, for me, pink is a color of friendship, the mm -hmm. color of love also, I guess, to some extent. We think of baby girls, women, um, femininity. Mm -hmm. Yep, femininity. all of those. Yeah, you're spot on. Um, and I'll talk about love in a second, but absolutely femininity. Yes, in this culture, we have um, sex role typed color. We have assigned pink to girls and blue to boys. That's a whole other program. That's not, nothing to do with photography. But if you wanna have that conversation, <laughs> I welcome it because I disagree with that whole practice. But anyway, yes. So pink is a color combination, a hue of red and white combined. So it completely alters the hue. And taking the intensity out of the red to make it pink, it does feminize it again in this culture. And pink is um, the color most often associated with romance. Red, which we'll get to is, well, I won't even say about red yet. Pink is thought to be very thoughtful and caring, a more gentle and approachable color choice. And more widely accepted as less polarizing. I think that was like a double negative, but does that make sense? It's globally a color that most people can live with. It's not a polarizing color. There absolutely are polarizing colors in which people love or hate. And we'll definitely talk about those. Well, I think that there's a lot of people that, I think pink roses, for instance, are supposed to represent friendship. Exactly. because. Let's just, well, okay, we'll talk about that. Red is about love and passion and intensity, right? And so that's why the red rose, I mean, you, you wouldn't give, well, and forgive all the global generalizations, but, you know, I probably wouldn't give Lois a dozen red roses. We know that's reserved for our love partners, our, our romantic partners. 
but I'd give her a dozen pink, which I probably should after this because she's helped me a tremendous amount. <laughs> I just did some screenshots to show you this example of a monochromatic color scheme. So in Photoshop, if you, mm, you, can, can, you can see my cursor, right? My mouse? Yes, we can. Yeah, so the screen works the same, okay. So if you open in Photoshop, you open an image and you go down here to this palette right here, I'm just moving on it. It opens this color dialog box and it gives you an, eye, uh, an eyedropper tool. And you can go through your image to learn your own colors and click in different places just to see exactly what's what. And I won't break down the numerical value of each color because then we'd be here for you know, weeks and I'm not Scott Kelby, so I wouldn't even dare to dream. But if you look at this box right here and watch where the dot comes up, so it corresponds to where the eyedropper tool is placed. That's what that is, if you're not familiar with it. And Lois, if I go too fast, just tell me to zip it or jump back because I... Well, I just I want to let you know that this is being recorded on YouTube Live also. So if anybody would like to go back afterwards, we'll share that link so that you can come back and watch it over and over and over again. <laughs> yeah, because they, they want to do that. <laughs> Same lame jokes, same silliness. Um, yeah, sure, watch it forever. Or just email me if you have a question. I'm totally cool with that too. Okay, so open Photoshop, start clicking through where the eyedropper is placed here is what's gonna correspond to this dot up here. I didn't make these screenshots for every one of the images that I'm gonna talk about, but I did wanna do it for this one so that you could really see um, not theoretically, but technically where the differences in the shades and the tints lie. So there's the eyedropper teal. Now, see, if we were in person, I'd say, you know, I'd offer you challenges because that's really fun. But I'm going to say that where this eyedropper tool is, many of you could not have predicted that it's actually this color red that's under the word new right here. That is that color. That's how this tool works in Photoshop. So that's its color. So you can tell that this is a monochromatic tone because it's, if I scroll through them again, same image obviously, but look at the different hues of this color. Monica, are our mm -hmm. brains affected by the colors that are around where your eyedropper is. Yes, which is why you probably couldn't predict that that spot on this rose is that color red. So if you were to crop this all the way down into the area that is just that spot, then you would be, oh yeah, that's totally, you know, maroon or crimson or however you would describe that color. But when it's surrounded, there's two problems. It's surrounded by a different hue. There's more real estate that's a hue of a lighter value. Well, and that's the other problem. So it's the hue, the amount of the other hue, and then that the lightness value around the perimeter of the image where the actual highlights are is so much brighter. So yes. Okay, thanks. Does that make sense? Yes, ma'am. Okay, good. All right. And where's that? Oh, yes. So here's the highlight. Look how close to white that is. So here's the eyedropper tool. There's the little dot. And then there's the actual representation of what the color is. Also, I think you wouldn't be able to predict that that is the color of that, that it's that light pink. Similar rows, very different feel, right? Very different. Red has tremendous impact. Um, we spoke briefly earlier about that it's romantic, that it's a sexual color, it's related with passion. Um, 
It's a color that is also closely aligned with power. It may or may not have been a certain high level politician that typically wore a red tie to important events because that's the power tie. That's red is meant to be, can be used as an intimidating color and something that stimulates and is very exciting. So it's not the thing that you're going to put in a healthcare facility. And we're, we're gonna talk about appropriate artwork for healthcare just a little bit. It's not a red rose because red is also the color of when you cut yourself, right, the audience is so loud. <laughs> it's also the color of blood. Now you don't think about, your brain doesn't process that. When you look at a red rose or a red piece of fine art photography like this, you don't think, oh, that's the color of blood. And that makes me think of blood and oh, pain. And oh, you don't do all of that. But that's programmed because of the culture that we live in. We've all unfortunately seen horror movies. Um, some of us have had emergency situations in healthcare where we've seen blood, somebody else's blood, our blood, and it's bright red. So we make that unconscious association between pain and trauma and the color red. So in this case, is it a bad reaction when you look at this? No, I hope not. You don't go, oh, blood, ah, scary. No, but if this was done in really soft pink, it would have a different feel. It would have a different impact. So you, you take that frame of reference, that sort of cultural embedded training, and you unconsciously apply it to your artwork. And if you understand that this is what happens, then you'll make a choice depending on your audience as to either what to create in general or what to show. So I, I do a lot of, so slight aside, I do a lot of private coaching for people and they're like, oh, I want to sell more. Okay. Well, where are you showing? Um, at the church art fair every Sunday. Hmm. Okay. Are you trying to sell pieces like this? And this, you know, or are you trying to sell something like soft and pretty? And they're like, oh, I love my red abstract stuff. But what are you talking about? That's fantastic. That's a piece of a rose. How terrific. Mm, okay, but know your audience. That might not be the audience. Now you go to something like the Old Town Art Fair or something, you know, like a different place and show work like this, you're going to have a different reaction, a different response. And we're back to, uh, right? Lavender, violet. This is a color that you can breathe through because it's in that cool color scheme. It's lending itself to relaxation. You see a lot of this color in um, spas and places like that where they actually want you to relax. You don't see a lot of this color in restaurant design. They don't want you to relax. You see a lot of bold, bright colors in restaurants like the red because it stimulates, it has scientifically been shown that red stimulates the appetite. So they don't want you to come in chill and, you know, they want you to chill at a spa, not chill at a restaurant. So violet is one of those colors that's related to the imagination and spirituality. Again, that's why you see it a lot in spas and places where they want you to calm down. Um, it's said to, you know, stimulate um, higher thinking and, and creativity and just kind of allow you to center and to find yourself because it's not a color that has a lot of connotations to it, like red, like pink, right? Lois had a bunch of things about pink that she'd already kind of were already preconceived. So the soft violets and lavenders don't have as much direct association. I have to drink because I'm talking so much. I was so excited when I found this, I don't know what kind of plant this is. Um, when I was shooting with out of Chicago last year in the botanical gardens of 
Philadelphia somewhere. I don't know. Um, I'm going to get letters for that. Violet occurs rarely in nature. So when it does, we're really, really, really drawn to it. It's more of an exotic kind of color and it's unexpected. So it can be tied to mm, like fantasy because because it's not something that you see every day. So when you do see it, you know, it's, it's really, really very eye-catching, but it is one of those colors, um, less violet, but more purple, that is polarizing. People either love it or hate it. And fun fact, I didn't think about sharing this, but it just came to me. When I was a teenager, uh, 392 years ago, I was so, I became so obsessed with purple and my mom was really cool that she allowed me to dye all of my undergarments and socks and several t-shirts bright purple. And I loved it. And then she bought me a purple leather jacket. Oh man, the cool factor. I mean, who else had a purple leather jacket? It was so, it was so awesome. I loved her forever for that. So purple is one of those colors I do like to create with because I find it very energizing. While this presentation, a full bleed violet um, subject matter, which also your brain recognizes as flowers. And we know that a flower petal is soft. So there's a visual understanding as to what's happening as well as the color reinforcement. So while that is calm and chill, that is not for several reasons. Now, the, the other kind of problem with a presentation like this is that you're looking at this on your monitor that could be all kinds of, you know, have strange color shifts. So trust me when I tell you that this image um, is really electric, vibrant. I just thought of a skill testing question for one of the giveaways. What if we ask people to guess what this is? How's that? Is that? Do you think that's a good choice, I, ladies? I love it because I was actually going to ask you what it is, but I'd rather have people guess. Okay, good. So I'll give you a clue. Um, then the name of the item has two words. So like, um, um, like picture frame has two words. The name of the item has two words. So that's all I'm going to say. All right. Can okay. people start guessing yet or not yet? Um, that's up to you. If you want to keep track of it, that's fine. Okay. And people, yeah. so folks, if you want to be in on Monica's competition to possibly win a prize, you can chat us up on YouTube live and let us know what your guess is as to what this is. So there may be a prize involved. It's a good prize too. All the prizes I have are from Miller's professional imaging. They are a really fantastic lab. Um, I love to tell this story because I think it's so impactful. I mean, obviously whenever I, I call, they, I get it. I get a human. I'm like, oh, I have a question, but there was a photographer in a group that I am a member of who worked with Miller's shipped with Miller's and Miller's sent her order out and it got stolen off of her porch and her ring cam, you know, showed that it got stolen. And she just, you know, called Miller's was like, oh, bummer, you know, I have to upload everything again because the whole package got stolen. Well, they replaced everything. And she didn't even ask for that. And they certainly didn't have to do that because they had no culpability in the theft, but they're just that kind of a company. So I am behind Miller's a thousand percent. I, I just really think they're awesome. And you can actually always get a human being. So if, if your color is wackadoodle and you don't know why your prints are coming out orange when they should be green or vice versa, then you just call them and have a conversation. Well, and looking at things on a computer screen and having them printed are entirely different animals also, right? Oh, a hundred percent. That's why professionals calibrate their monitors, right? So I have this funky device that I stick on my monitor and then run some software and it flashes a bunch of colors so that it's calibrated. But when I started with Miller's, what they do, and when you get your account with them, you will 
send them, you'll calibrate your monitor hopefully, but if you can't, okay, it is what it is. Um, you'll send them five files and they'll print them, test prints, and then bring them back and you look at them on your screen and you're like, hmm. And you can go so far as to download what they call ICC color profiles for Millers, but they'll walk you through all of that. So if this is like whoosh, already, don't worry about it. Just call them, get a person, tell them I sent you. So the question for the potential prize for Millers is what the heck is this? All right, so guys, go ahead and start chatting us. Let us know what your guesses are as to what this is, this mystery picture, what did she start with? And make sure um, that your name is like clear. They're putting this through YouTube, right? So they might have like a handle versus like a real name. We're seeing your names. Okay, cool. You guys can take care of that. You already have some guesses. Ooh, don't tell me. All right, so that's monochromatic. One color, so easy. Complementary colors. Simply put, these are colors that are opposite on the color wheel to each other. Oh, I just looked at how bright I was. How about I turn that down for your faces? I'm so sorry. Complementary colors, two different colors that are on opposite places on the color wheel. A very, very, very fun color scheme to use. But can you guess? Let's take guesses. Let's see if this works. Can you guess what um, what adjective would you say best describes? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's do this. What adjective best describes a complementary color scheme in terms of your reaction to it? If we get crickets, I'll move on. <laughs> when I think of things that are complementary. I think of things that are opposite but yet fit together. So mm -hmm. kind of like in a yin and yang kind of way. Right, right, right. So or when you look like at that. something that's in a complementary color scheme like this, how do you feel? How does it make you feel? I'm a little bit, what's the word? Perhaps a little bit conflicted right here. Exactly. It's, that's exactly right. And we didn't even rehearse this. So it's not a restful color scheme. And that's good if you know how to use it. And it's not rocket science because the colors are literally on the opposite sides of the color scheme. Uh, anybody familiar with the, um, what are they called? The Lakers, LA Lakers basketball team? Might've heard of them. Might've heard of them. That's not a restful situation. You don't want a restful situation. That's a basketball team. You want energy and pumped up. Well, purple and yellow, oh, like that's such a crazy color combination. It's so bold. It's so in your face that it's not restful. That's fine. As long as you know how to use it. it would be interesting to find out whether teams that use complementary colors that are opposite have been more successful also. That's a fascinating question. That would require a little bit of research, but I think you're right. That would be very, very interesting to know. Um, red and green, Christmas, right? But Christmas, despite your in-laws, is um, a fun time, but sometimes kind of stressful. Complementary color schemes are intense. They are not restful. Now you can dial it back a little tiny bit if you want to change the values by shading or by tinting, by adding white or changing the brightness value like this. So it's blue and yellow, they're opposites on the color wheel, but it's not the Lakers, it's not screaming at you because of the way, well, the way that I photographed this. So I, I, I like to put this in here. Let me tell you the story about how this is done. This is a frozen bubble. Now you can't freeze a bubble unless it's cold outside, <laughs> really cold. You make a solution of dish soap. Hmm, what was the dish soap, uh, glycerin. Oh, um, there's one other thing. Email me for the formula. I swear I'll give it to you. I just can't remember it off the top of my head. So that would be Monica at monicaroyal.com? Yes, thank you. Good thing I didn't give the wrong address. Right? <laughs> Somebody named Monica be like, formula. Would children, 
bubbles from a container that they buy at the store work for this also? No, not at all. And here's why. Um, wait, let me just, it's okay. So it's dish soap. Um, oh, I'm so mad at myself right now. The reason that the bubbles won't work is because what you're seeing are frost crystals that are forming with inside layers of soap and water, or the, it's the water that's freezing inside the layers of soap. So you mix this solution. I so hate myself right now for blanking, but at least I can still tell the story. <laughs> Um, it's actually super easy to find on the web too. Since I'm such a dork right now, you could just Google it. Um, but you blow a bubble, land it on wherever you want. You don't let it go in the air. You like place it somewhere and then take it out of using a straw. And it will immediately, the, the frost will grow around the bubble until it bursts. So you get to play all day long. It has to be less than 24 degrees outside. So really damn cold. Um, so you can play as long as you can stand it. It's really helpful to have an assistant if somebody can blow bubbles for you because they don't fly through the air like that. You place them on something. And then of course you're using a tripod, manually focusing, and you have about, mm, I don't know, maybe, maybe if you're lucky, like up to seven or eight seconds before it will burst. And the trick is to get the natural light to come through it, to really illuminate it. And every, every bubble, I don't know, I maybe have like 15 or 20 frames because you want to catch it when it's like creeping, 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 creeping. And then by the time it envelops it, it usually pops a hole and then the whole thing disintegrates. And you can build sets. I literally built this set with snow. I just collected, I found a really cool place on a fence and I saw that the sun was coming up. Did I mention it was five in the morning? I don't think you're a morning person normally. Well, I am a morning person, but morning and 20, it was 23 degrees and it was like 5.30 in the morning. I mean, come on, you you have to love what, you, what you're doing or what you're trying to do to be put through that condition. I mean, it was, I don't know. It was fun for me for a time period. Um, Tasha's mother was literally in the cabin. She's making me coffee and she was standing in the window watching me. And I, uh, and then I would open the door and she'd give me some coffee and then I close the door and then I go back to work. It was super sweet. And so it was really fun to make this, but that's what you need. You need that solution. You need patience, a good macro lens and some really damn cold temperatures. Well, I'm, Sure, you got a lot of excellent pictures. And if this is any indication, it was worth it to wake up at 5 a.m. Yeah, thank you. It was really worth it. It was really worth it. Um, I think this is so fun because I think the best artwork is the one that starts a conversation. And frozen bubbles usually start a conversation because not a lot of people do them. Not here, anyway they kind of do at home where I'm from in Eastern Canada, but here it's kind of an anomaly. So next time you go skiing up at Big Bear or, you know, wherever, just take your macro lens, your camera and go shoot some frozen bubbles. So back to the color scheme, that's blue and yellow, but it's really dialed down. Red and green, not Christmas, but still really vibrant, strong contrast, even though, you know, with the bokeh in the background, that kind of helps to, to, to downgrade this image from something, you know, LA Lakers screaming, crazy, eclectic. It just softens it a little bit. I've used the circles in the background, the bokeh, to just kind of tone this down. If it was flat green in the back, I think it would just be, you know, a little bit too much. So Monica, I noticed that the colors are not super saturated in this image either. Um, they're not, I didn't change anything. This is almost right out of camera because as I'm looking at it, I can see some edits I'd like to do, which happens to me all the time. It's just, I, I don't describe myself as a perfectionist, um, but every time I look at a piece of artwork, there's something I could change. So I say I'm not a perfectionist because I'm not going to criticize it and say, oh, I should have done this. But every time a piece of artwork that I haven't looked at for a while comes around, 
like, oh, I might change this and change that. I like to think that I'm just developing artistically versus criticizing what I had done previously. So what you're saying is that your visual eye and how you see things is continuing to evolve. Yes. Mm -hmm. And, and sometimes I'll make a change and then look at it again and then go back and put it back. I, I think we're so influenced by so many things that are constantly bombarding us that sometimes we'll just second guess our own creative process and make an edit that we think might be better. And that's overthinking. Sometimes we just change our preferences and that's, I think, pretty normal. Right. Good to know that it's not just each of us individually, but also someone like you that is known for your fine art that feels that way. Yeah. It, I mean, mm -hmm. <laughs> and sometimes I'll look at something and think, what were you thinking? Or what is redeeming about this? Why did you like that? And that's actually a good exercise to do. Go back and look at your work and ask yourself, why did I design it this way? Why, why is the green against the red? Why did I choose that? Did I do it deliberately in the beginning or did it kind of just happen? So this goes back to that whole marketing thing, like not actual marketing, but you know, market research where I talked about in the beginning when you show your images to people. So if you are constantly photographing um, a, a complementary color scheme over and over and over, and you don't know it until today, and you're starting to analyze what color scheme am I using, then that's info for you. If you like this color scheme and you're constantly doing this, then know that it is um, a high contrast, um, energetic, exciting color scheme. It's not always restful and peaceful. So if that's the artwork you're producing and you're trying to sell it, then know your audience. Split complementary colors. Oh, sorry. You can look at that for a second longer. So to dumb it down, two on one side, one on the other. Just in case you didn't get that slide the first time, I intentionally included it twice. <laughs> so last year I found myself trapped in a cabin for 14 days um, with not much to do except survive a hurricane, um, make fires every day and take pictures. And so this is one of the images that I made. It's a wine glass, which didn't come with a drop on it. And so, duh, I need to put one on it. But the color is created by me using just two pieces of plastic and just holding them in the right light, just beyond the glass. There's really not any more clear way to explain the creation of this unless I showed you the behind the scenes video which would have been a good idea had I thought about that. So for next time, I'll make sure that I have that video. But you can create your color schemes by using very simple and inexpensive materials. It's just plastic, like they're, they're plastic office dividers, which I have now collected several. And another reason to study color theory is because you can layer them when you buy the different colors. And so if you understand what colors make what colors, like that red and blue makes purple, then you can have even more control. And if you have a syringe, you can place droplets on things until the cows come home. So Monica, I know it's not really officially a part of this presentation, but how did you even come up with this idea? And I mean, I'm, I'm gonna ask you this question because I have actually, seen you break things or come across something broken uh -huh. you've taken broken wine classes and made fine art with it how do you come up with these crazy ideas well first you drink all the wine in the wine glass then you unleash your creativity i mean it's <laughs> 
not really, or really. Um, so it started with a simple, just natural obsession. Um, I didn't, when I started on the fine art, so when I launched my business in 2006, I was like, oh, portrait photographer. Okay. Cause that's all I really thought there was. It wasn't until about 2014. I was like, hmm, actually here's this genre called fine art photography. How fun. I want to play in that world. And so then I just started taking pictures of everything with my macro lens. I had the first generation Tamron macro lens that my dad had purchased for me. And I just started playing. I knew nothing. So I was only photographing what I liked. I wasn't designing. I wasn't, I had no intention. It was like a spray and pray. I was just making stuff up. And some of it started to work. And I had to go back after studying with masters like Freeman Patterson and other people, I had to go back and realize, okay, that's what I was obsessed with, broken glass and stuff like that. And here's what I tried, but now apply more intentional design. Ah, okay, now I know what to do. So when I see a piece of glassware like this, this is my stepmom Heather's wine glass. She has a collection Whew, it's you're going to see several because I can't afford the wine glasses that she has. And so when I go home to New Brunswick, I always photograph her glass. So to answer your question, I hope I am answering it. Um, it, it you have to study. So you find what you like, what you naturally gravitate towards, and then you have to study and you have to practice because it doesn't come the obsession comes naturally, but the application of the education doesn't unless you're, well, I don't know how that would happen because you, you, you can't just make it. Uh, you can't know what you don't know until someone teaches you. That's what I'm trying to say. So it started as an obsession. Then I studied and trained and now I can apply it. So now if you're, if you're out there and you're like, yeah, but this is composition 101, that doesn't align with the rule of thirds. No, it doesn't. But if you place Fibonacci's golden spiral over it, it aligns perfectly. That would be an example of something I did not know when I started. Color schemes, okay. Analogous, analogous, however you want to say it. There's, I think, only really one right way to say it, which is analogous. There you go. There they are. Groups of three next to each other on the color wheel. One other disclaimer, and I, I do tend to make kind of a lot of disclaimers because you can't cover everything. So we're not doing tertiary colors. We're not doing um, triadic color schemes because we don't have time because we can't be late. And it's already 10 to two. We're done at 2.30, right? That's correct. Yes. So we still have, I would say that in about 20, 30, about 30 minutes, yeah. we can start wrapping it up. Mm -hmm. So I know you have other more very important things to do today. <laughs> Always. Um, okay, analogous colors. And we're, I'm, I always end on time. I, I hate being late. I'm like, the phrase in my family is I hate late. My kids aren't late. I'm not late. If we are, there's a really serious problem. So um, you, you should know that. So analogous colors. This is a really fun place to play because it's less, um, it's easier to not make, it's less hard to make a mistake. It's easier to not make a mistake. Yeah, I'm not really sure how I'm saying that. Say, Monica, if I can interrupt you, we do have a question from okay. our viewers. Okay. Um, I hope I'm saying your name properly. It's Sri Dor. Would you have any work, non-macro, landscape type, with which you have used the color scheme? With which I have used an analogous color scheme specifically? Yeah. Was it regarding analogous or was that before? I believe it was during the analogous. During the analogous. Hmm. Well, I would have to look through my library, which currently is at 117,000 images. 
to be able to answer that precisely. So probably is the best answer I can give you, probably. Because I do shoot a lot of landscapes, um, but I, yeah, I, I don't wanna like make stuff up or BS. Yeah, so I can't answer that without going through and looking at them. Okay. Sorry. All right. Okay. So we're back to green, which we haven't really gone over. We're a little out of order. That's all right. Let's talk about this. Nana's wine glass, my stepmother, Heather, this is her wine glass. This is Italian crystal. It's so exquisite. I can't even tell you. So these are cuts that are actually in the wine glass themselves. Now I don't gravitate to green. In nature, yes, but in fine art, I have very few, in fact, I think almost no macro fine art images that have green in the design. So I intentionally, when I was trapped in the cottage for 14 days in quarantine, surviving a hurricane and eating off of a wood stove, um, I made some images for my partner, Tasha, who loves green and I don't work in green. So I was like, okay, well, here's the challenge, right? And so, I found this glass, the water drops my thing, simply applied it, you know, with a syringe, which you probably don't have in your back pocket. I usually do, <laughs> but you can get um, little baby medicine droppers from the pharmacy and you can actually order diabetic needles online without a prescription. They're very, very, very small, um, very small and harmless and they will pick up water and allow you to place water drops with precision that's fantastic. And um, a trick is if you do this and you start placing water drops on smooth surfaces like glass and you don't like it, you just take the syringe and, and put it on the drop and, and pull the stopper out and it will suck up the water and many times leave you with a completely clean surface. It's pretty awesome. Or you can just wash the surface. But so this is a wine glass and this is created in um, a green color scheme, which is typically very calming. So let's talk about blue. I kind of inserted that green, but we'll get to the details of, of green in a bit. So blue is traditionally a conservative type of color, not conservative politically, just a conservative type of color. So the woman that wears, you know, a pale blue cocktail dress to an evening soiree is probably a different woman than who is then the other, another one who's going to wear, you know, this color, this, this um, fuchsia color that I'm wearing or a bright red cocktail dress. Blue is 10 tends to be more conservative. It's uh, considered a safer color, um, less threatening, obviously softer, calmer. Its best friend is that lavender and violet that we spoke about earlier, where you would find that in spas and places where you're meant to chill out. Blue is calming, very effective that way. Um, we tend to have a sense of relaxation when we're surrounded by blue. They also say that blue is associated with freedom. I'm not really sure I buy that, but it's an interesting theory. Ah, so the pros about blue, we said, oh yeah, blue is so fabulous. It does all these things. Well, it can also be cold, literally cold. So would you agree that this image feels less visually cold than this? Yes, uh, definitely. Okay, good, yay, I win. So the reason, there's two things that are happening with your brain. This is a different value, right? It has, it's a different hue. It ha, it's, it's a lighter value, so it's literally lighter. But also the subject matter, that thing, that thing about blood from earlier, that's happening in your brain and you don't even know it. So this is a dandelion fluff. Incidentally, it's one, it's just one, one little teeny, teeny, tiny dandelion fluff that I had to manipulate with tweezers. 
So you know that a dandelion fluff is soft. And so when you look at this and I trick you and I say, which one of these feels you know, softer than the other or less cold or less hard, you say this one because you know that a dandelion fluff is soft. So it's that frame of reference that's like tricking your brain and your eyes. And when you add something like this with harder lines, more definitive lines, and then you pair this kind of V with a very hard edge circle, there's two things that are happening. The color sensory is going to your brain, going, ooh, blues and purples, it's cold. But the subject matter also conveys a sense of what we would call cold or hard. Some people have said, oh, this looks like a type of like metal, like steel or something. And in fact, it's glass. I think it looks like glass with a drop on it, but <laughs> that's just my thing. Um, but blue can you know, work against you sometimes. So this, uh, the person that hangs this piece of fine art in their home is not going to be the person who hangs the red rose. Now, yes, people can like all kinds of different art and they should, but I'm just using these examples as um, ways to kind of uh, define the characteristics of a color. There's, there's no rules. There's no rules in art. There's no hard and fast rules. One thing we haven't really talked about so far is contrast. And the degree to which you use contrast within your color harmonies adds another layer of the effect of those color harmonies because it's all going back to the viewer's experience. So what have we here? Hmm, dandelion. Wait a minute, Monica, that's a dandelion too. That feels soft, oh, soft and small and pretty, yay. And that feels like, oh, wow, hard and kind of psychedelic and busy and intense and in your face. Well, it's backlit, so there's that. That's always going to change everything because it's going to make your subject matter in the front fade into shadow to a certain degree, right? It's silhouetted to a certain degree. Um, it's just water on a dandelion, and it happens to be backlit by the TV. This was a happy accident, but it works. Monica, if I recall correctly, your TV is often a backdrop for many of your fine art photos. Um, it is. And I recently saw someone who was doing some things with putting images on the screen and then photographing that and incorporating that into their artwork. And I, I was really inspired. I really want to try to do that because to date I've used it for value. I've, I've used, pardon me, also the Savage light box. I mean, light table just to add value and hue. I haven't used it to incorporate subject matter. And I think that would be really cool. Ah, oh, the warms. What do we do with the warm tones? What a completely different feel this is, right? It's, it's energetic, but not threatening like red. It's kind of like I describe this kind of gold orange as a hug. Because I, I once I don't know why my friend did this, but my friend said, Bob, he said, pick a color for the interior of our house. Okay. So I did. And they went with it and they painted it this gold orange. I'm going to say it was somewhere, somewhere up in this kind of range. And he said, when I walk into my home, it feels like I'm getting a great big hug. And I thought that was the greatest thing. So orange is not a threatening color. Um, it is something that usually is associated with happiness along the lines of yellow, right? You see, again, back to the whole typical um, role playing that they're or role typing that they do. Little girls wear little yellow sundresses and orange with polka dot sundresses. And that's meant to convey a sense of levity and happiness and joy. So you'll often see those things associated with the color orange. 
Now I said, Monica. Yeah, go ahead. Mm -hmm. we, interrupt, we have a question from a viewer. Okay. Um, so this is from Sura Dor again. Also, do you color grade these macros for your chosen color schemes or set up the light gels? Um, do you mean if I if you're saying color grade like in post? No, I don't want to be behind the computer as much as I can not have to be. Why am I speaking in like triple negatives today? I don't want to be behind the computer if I don't have to be. So I do just about everything I can do in camera. And so that involves creating backgrounds or finding backgrounds. So if I can zip back, doot, doot, the background in this is just out the window. But there's this is the time of day. It's, it's literally the view out my window and then into my yard. So there's really nothing for so for you know, several hundred feet. So there's nothing discernible, but the reason it's blue is just the quality of light. And so the optics of a macro lens really change everything and they're not comparable to any other lens. They are their own beast. So macro lenses are fixed focal length lenses and have a different um, optical, provide a different optical experience or effect than any other kind of lens. And if you don't have one, you should play with one. So Monica, did you pluck these dandelions and other things out of the ground and then carefully bring them home to make these on like your kitchen table? So this, <laughs> this is embarrassing. This particular one, I knew I needed more dandelions in my portfolio. And so my son was younger at the time and I literally gave him $5 to walk the street until he found a dandelion. <laughs> I swear, put it in a plastic like sandwich bag over it, right? And then walk back home. And he came home with one. <laughs> Child labor. So I don't, so to go back to the question, I don't really add color gradients in post. Now this has a vignette, which 99.9 .9 images in the world, in my opinion, should have a vignette. So that's one of them. Um, this also has a vignette, but I use the radial filter vignette in Lightroom. So you can draw a vignette of any shape or size so that it doesn't have to come in symmetrically from the edges. Um, did I answer the question? I got, I, did, I answered the question about uh, gradients, right? But there was a second part to that question. Yes, no, there was not. So it looks like you did answer that question. Okay, yes. Almost always in camera for just about everything. Um, yes, yes, yes. What am I doing? Oh yeah, that's right, green. So I know I said I don't create in green. I don't create fine art studio stuff in green. The first time I did that was the series that I made for my partner, Tasha. And by the way, she loved it. Uh, there's two in that green square series and she loved them. But in nature, green all the way. And I mean, first of all, the simplicity of this design, I feel like I don't even deserve to have such a great image because I didn't create it, I found it. I can take a lot of credit for images that I create in the studio when they work, but I just came across this. I felt like almost like a thief, like an intruder because these little tendrils I thought were just loving each other and it just, I think the composition and the subject matter of this image, I think this is extremely romantic and loving. But also remember, if you're sitting there going, what? I was there. So we're always back to frame of reference. You might look at this image and say, that's a drag, like it's boring or, you know, there's nothing special about it or whatever, it's bland or it's empty or too much negative space or whatever your response might be. I like it because I was there for the experience of it. So that's that, okay? That's why I like it. Now, the fact that I created it in green, because the tendrils were green, of course I didn't grow them, but the background wasn't. Where the background was, was not green. It was, um, there was a fence, so it was very dark, blending, uh, moving more towards like black. And so, I had to very uncomfortably stand on, I had to find something to stand on. It was like a rock and it was all tilty and weird. 
And I had to stand on that and crane myself to be able to use the rest of the, of the plant to make its own background. So if you're not familiar with macro photography, the beauty of it is that you can have something that's a background. I've used t-shirts for backgrounds. Easy, because at 2.8, at f2.8, you're gonna throw it crazy out of focus like this. So the background for this image is the plant itself. And I knew that I was designing that when I made the image because I wanted this to have just a very basic, simple feel. Green, when you photograph green um, botanical matter like this, it has to be all healthy, no brown, no little bit of anything dying. Green is a very serene, calming color. Um, it's restful. It usually evokes a sense of abundance. Um, you know, people do think about money and wealth when it comes to green. They also sometimes think about envy and spite. But I think that, that you could control that based on the subject matter that you're showing. <sighs> green. I do sell a lot of artwork to the healthcare industry. And you cannot have any dead little piece of leaf or brown piece of anything in, um, in any macro or otherwise or landscape. Well, wait, I say you should not. And I don't should very often, but you really should not. Um, there's a whole theory called biophilia, which is about what kind of artwork is universally appealing to all humans or most humans. And so just trust me, because this isn't a program on that, trust me when I say, if you're trying to sell artwork um, to the healthcare industry, it has to be green, alive, vibrant, um, and then also have to have good design. Now, back to a split, uh, what I, um, a complimentary, right? So same thing, easy, easy. And then you add red, boom, a burst of contrast going back to the opposites, just, you know, to create some drama. Okay, so this is a fine art piece that I designed on the light table. So this is the large Savage Universal light table, laid it down took this dead tulip, placed the petals where I wanted them, photographed it. Okay, fine, I like it, it works. But just watch the difference. So look at the image and then watch the difference when I do that, right? I just killed it. Well, it was dead here already, but it was a lot more acceptable because it's, high contrast piece, it's high key, which is a really bright background. But the green, even though the flower is dead, the green is alive. Once you kill the green, well, then you just killed the, the whole thing. We have questions? Well, conversely, you could take that orange or yellow or brown stem and mm -hmm. If you know, if you understand tonal curves mm -hmm. in processing, you could actually make that green, could you not? Well, yeah, because it was, so this is out of camera and then that's what I did to it to illustrate this point. So yes, if you have something and you photograph it like this, then yes, you can use editing software to put it back the other way. Yes. I love how you've taken one photo and you're playing with the colors to make it feel like it's entirely something else. Yeah, that's what I do. I just like to play. That's just fun. So would you suggest that we go back to our pictures or that we've taken before and play around with them and see if they make us feel differently if we change colors? Yes, 100%. And then I think you should go back through, you know, if you're trying to sell representational art, like this piece on the screen, representational art is 
basically it is what it is. So you're like, oh, hmm, that's a trumpet tree in Balboa Park. Well, you probably don't know it's in Balboa Park, but oh, that's a trumpet tree. So you know that, but there are some problems with this. If you wanted to sell it to the healthcare industry and some of those problems are the dead branches that don't have any foliage on them or, or any flowers on them, you know, that can be a sticking point. So remember in the beginning, I said, you show your work to somebody and they go, huh, or, Oh, it's a really fun game to take a good piece of art that you have already made and then apply these tweaks to it, either remove things that are distracting or considered unpleasant and then alter the color and then show that one and see what kind of a different reaction you get. I always think that's super fun. Just another high contrast color scheme. Uh, this is a long exposure of the ocean while panning. It's, a, it's just fun. I just included this because I just wanted to show you something fun that isn't macro. So you can take, I mean, if you're good, you can do it just manually. But if you're learning and you just want to figure out how to start to pan, take a tripod or a monopod and loosen the, um, not the ball head, lock that down, but just loosen the center column so that when you have your camera during the exposure, you just, whoosh, you just spin it, you just rotate it during the exposure. And I think this is a sixth of a second, sixth. Now, if you use it, um, an ND filter or a polarizing, no, an ND filter, then, you know, you could shoot faster in different times a day and it gets way more complicated, but yeah. Monica, what are, right. what are ND filters? Uh, neutral density filters. So you can have graduated neutral density filters or I have um, a 10 stop neutral density filter. It's basically um, fake uh, nighttime. <laughs> so it's a filter that cuts light. You go out at six in the uh, five in the morning and you're shooting, let's say, I mean, this is sunset, but okay, let's say you're doing a sunrise and it's early. And then you want less light in the atmosphere because you want to use a longer shutter speed because you want slow water. That's what this is called. It's called slow water. You can put a neutral density filter on and it will cut light. And the one I use cuts light up to 10 stops which means you can basically keep shooting longer when the sun is coming up and still do these long exposures. Now, at some point the sun is up and it's too bright and even a 30th of a second is too slow and you're not gonna get, or it's too fast for slow water and you know it's just gonna be too bright. But a neutral density filter is what you wanna use if you want to do slow water. We do have a, another question. This is related to the uh, green harmony scheme mm -hmm. that you showed earlier. The value mm -hmm. change in the background is done so naturally. What's the, um, what is its importance compared to uniform color? Can you read that one more time, please? The value change in the background is done so naturally. What is the importance compared for uniform color? I don't understand that question. It's I'm sure it's me. Importance compared to uniform color. I guess because you had, it wasn't a solid color background. Mm -hmm. Well, sometimes you work with what you have. Um, again, the gift of a macro lens is F2.8 because you are working with millimeters of depth of field, right? So any, that's why we use a tripod. So any, even imperceptible movements is going to throw your image out of focus, which is a problem when you have subject matter like those twisted tendrils, but it's great when you have, you know, you're shooting in your kitchen and you have a sink full of dirty dishes. You're not gonna see them because if they're 10 feet away and you shoot at F2.8, you're going to throw that so out of focus that there'll be nothing in the background okay, and so your life will be easy. The clarification was the above questions was with green harmony scheme. So with green harmony scheme and and color and value, I think it might be the picture where we had the hearts with the that were entwined with the green background where you had to 
where I had to move on a rock. Yeah. Uh Uh-huh. That's so cute that you thought they were hearts. That's so cute. It does take the shape of a heart. See, that's Lois's frame of reference popping up because she's interpreting that through, you know, through her own brain and her own um, perception. So that's awesome. So I'm, I'm thick and obtuse. I'm sure I still don't really understand the question, but let me just say that having a background that has some irregularities in value, such as this, right? You do have lighter spots here, darker spots here, gives it a little bit more of a sense um, of, a, of a dynamic situation versus a flat think, green piece of paper. Monica, I think you just answered the question. Um, the poster did ask about the value change in the background versus a uniform color. So I think you just hey. answered the question by saying it's dynamic. Good. Yes, it's more than it. So if you found these tendrils out there and you're like, oh, okay, but wait, I have a piece of green paper in my back pocket. Yay. And you slap that behind it. Well, A, it's probably going to look a little bit artificial. And B, um, it, it's just, it's not a secondary element. There's no, it's flat. It's full on just flat. So it would lack the, any kind of dynamic tonal range, any variety I, I think I, I feel like I'm not being articulate about it, but um, try it. <laughs> I think you'll see what would happen. It would take away the depth, right? Because when you study elements of art, shape is flat and two dimensional, and form is three dimensional. Well, you can't create form without shadow. And if you have a flat background, It's not necessarily going to flatten your subject matter, but it can, it could, it could change the viewer's perception and make the the subject matter feel more flat. And if that's not what you want, then now you know the tool to use to change it. If it is what you want, like when I use some of the pieces of plastic to put behind the other, um, the glassware, then you know how to use that tool as well. Monica, I think that's an excellent response as far as how to create three dimensions by using the the textured background with, you know, the shades of light and dark. Well, thanks, Lois. So um, we're probably about 10 minutes out. Okay. We're finishing up um, everything. Do you want to power through the rest of it? And then we'll get real quick to your opportunity. Sure do. do. I'm going to skip all the stuff that isn't important. Um, white is my least favorite color to design with. White is typically associated with purity, cleanliness. If you look in our culture, who wears white? Doctors, nurses. It's the bridal color in North America. Brides wear white. It's not my favorite to play with. When I find white, I'm like, hmm, well, that looks pure and boring. So I had to hunt through my portfolio to try to find when I used white as its own subject matter. And that was it. That's just a slow exposure of some strips of paper, which has a long story, but I don't have time to tell it to you. (laughs) White with an accent color. Great idea. It breaks up the purity of the white. So if you're going for pure, go for pure. If you're one of those people that likes a solid white kitchen, then, you know, good luck with that. It'll feel clean when it's actually clean, but it will hide the dirt. Brown, comforting, stabilizing. It's the color of the earth. Not appropriate in healthcare, even though I just said lots of nice things about it. It is the color of our ground, but it's also the color of dirt. So when it comes to landscape, then it's something, um, you know, that, that you can use that isn't eclect, uh, electric, so it's not violet, right? It doesn't have the same response. Um, it's balanced. It's, it's just kind of, and sometimes it just goes away. If you look at this piece, your eye goes to the highlights first. We're rushing. We have to move on. Brown. Brown. Sort of. Brown hints of green, and then this massive shock of 
the sun, the orange. It's that warmth that, that heats up the cool tone of the this sort of brownish gray of the beach. Um, that's a cute bird, but we're gonna skip that. That's soft. I love pastels, not really. Rarely, but this is one of them that I actually really enjoyed making, mostly because a friend gave me these roses for my birthday and she loves flowers. And so I made this image for her. Um, there's very little post in it. That's the way it came out of camera. It's just backlit by a window, so it's all natural light. That's more me. That's the intensity. I gravitate towards bold colors and hard lines. I like circles a lot, but, um, but I like the intensity of this as well. I rarely create in black and white, but this was one of those times when I felt inspired. There have not been many of those times. That's the behind the scenes. Monica, we have another question. Okay. Um, do you feel like color associations are personal and subjective or there's a universal understanding? And do you find that color associations change across different cultures? Oh, hundred percent. I mean, Chinese wedding dresses are red, right? Red satin. So not just red, but shiny red, reflective. So I do think that there are commonalities amongst cultures and I also think there are commonalities um, amongst humans. So black is going to be black. It's going to represent darkness. It's going to always be, uh, it's going to create more contrast because it's the absence of light and color. And so when you add color, it's going to create huge contrast. So the person that likes this image is not necessarily going to be the same person that likes the pastel flowers, because this is, this is contrast upon contrast upon contrast because you've got just color, not just color, but also the contrast in the design because you have really hard lines. So I'm answering that extremely quickly because I want to get to the why and hmm, six minutes. I can do this in six minutes. Why? Control. You Having have control. Like five minutes left. I have six. Don't rob me of my minute. <laughs> Well, we have a drawing too, or drawings. Yeah, you're right. Okay. Um, okay. Let's see. 60 seconds. Someone came to me and said, I want to buy a piece of fine art. My feng shui consultant has told me it needs to be red, 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 red. She told me all the reasons why I needed to be red. And with a lot of conversation and getting to know her, I realized she actually doesn't like or want red. She had a beach house she wanted something that was soft in color temperature, soft and cool, but somehow the image had power. And so I created this triptych for her. It's soft in color, but it's powerful in subject matter. Back to the frame of reference, everybody knows the sound of a booming wave, right? So you can actually use a visual representation to make noise. And there it is in her house. Done, 60 seconds. Drawing. <laughs> this is going very well. Okay, so this is Miller's um, Giclée print. And the winner of this is going to be the person who can prove that they have the next nearest birthday to June 12th. And I would love it if your actual birthday is June 12th because birthdays are really, really important in my family. We had birthday month, we had gifts all the time. And birthdays are just a really big deal. It's a time when you can celebrate someone entirely. So let's go with birthday. Okay, so we're looking for birthdays closest to today. Let mm -hmm. us know if your birthday is today or do nearest birthday, coming up yes or nearest yep yeah. so yeah nearest today or the nearest upcoming birthday and you know honor system so you're going to send an email to sd fair photo at gmail.com
so are people sharing their birth, birth so people are starting to share birthdays right now okay we have a december 22nd we have a july 3rd which is the next one does anyone have a birthday before july 3rd anybody have a june i mean july 9th hmm. one person's all bummed out because apparently they're the opposite direction when is her birthday? Like June 11th? Didn't even share. Oh. All right. Are, do we have any more participants in the birthday challenge? We have a July 9th. Should we count down from 10, Monica? Yep. yep. 10, right, we're nine, count from 10 and then close out the birthday challenge. Let's count from five, five, four, three, two, type fast, one, you're done. Okay, who won? Let's just wait a second. This okay. A little bit of lag. Okay. We have a May 17th right now. Okay, I'm not seeing anybody else that looks like Daniel. <laughs> Lift off May 17th. Woohoo, you're winning, Yay. you're gonna print for a Miller's customer. So send us an email, Daniel at scfairphoto sc at gmail.com with your email address, and then we'll get you hooked up with Monica. All right, Monica, Perfect. do you want to move on to your next one? Yes. So this is wall art valued up to $100. Um, I print all of my images on Miller's aluminum or acrylic. I just love it. So in the interest of time, you're just gonna have to go to Miller's and check out the product or send me an email and I'll take time to explain it all to you. Who knows? I mean, nobody's gonna get it. What the subject matter was of that macro image at the beginning. Okay, so we're gonna go back and look at your guesses here. We already had some some guesses. We had uh, oil drops in water, cheese grater, oil drops in water, fizz in soft drinks, air bubbles, a lampshade, and a colander. Okay. Well, I realized oh, I'm not making any friends today. Um, I didn't think through what we were going to do if nobody guessed it. So duh me, I'm going to make an executive decision and I'm going to select cheese grater because that's funny. The answer is actually a milk crate, but I'm giving this prize to cheese grater. Well, so that who was that? Beth Dubor. So Beth Dubor. Oh, no kidding. So Beth, do you, are you already hooked up with, are you connected with her already? Or do you need information from her as to how to get it to her? Um, you should just take her contact information, but I, I'm okay. sure I think I have it. Beth, go ahead and email us at stfairphoto at gmail.com. Just so we can stay organized. So we can get it all together for you. All right. Okay. Monica. Um, I've got three of these. How do you want to give them away? Gee whiz. You got right? a lot of stuff going on here. Um, let's make this, do you have a question that you want to throw in there? Uh, how about, uh, the first person in chat, this is your pop quiz. What is, uh, Monica's least favorite color to work with? I was going to say that. Oh my gosh. You're like, right away. The first person in chat who answers that question. Okay, then I'm gonna ask another one because that's fine. They can still they can still do that at the same time. Um, my because there's three of these, right? And you get to pick one of these items. Um, what is the minimum? Ooh, this is hard. Ready? What is the minimum um, um, outside? What is the minimum environmental temperature that is required to make frozen bubbles? Yes, that's a good one, right? Okay, so we have two questions here. Oh, uh -huh. we have Kim Signoret Parr. She came in first with the answer of white as being Monica's least favorite color to work with. Yay, you win. So Kim, you're gonna be getting 
this gift. Mm -hmm. If you send us an email, Kim, at scfairphoto at gmail.com. And the other one was, I'm sorry, I have short-term memory loss. Um, the other question was, uh, oh, the uh, temperature to make the thank you. minimum so environmental temperature. So the temperature outside, the minimum required to make frozen bubbles. Okay. So we've got several guesses here mm -hmm. from a high of 27 degrees to a minus five right now so far. And let's wait a few seconds so that we okay. get all the answers in. Okay. Yeah. All right. Can we ask the last question? Because I have three of those. You want to give us your answer? The answer is 24 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay, so that's going to be Sear Door. So S R I H Door D O R E at 24 degrees. And it's positive 24 degrees, not minus, right? Correct. 24 Fahrenheit. Yeah, 24 Fahrenheit. If it's 24 Celsius, you're going to the beach. So. If you would give us a email, once again, at scfairphoto at gmail.com, we'll get this on to you. All right, Monica, any closing words? Um, that was really fun. That's how to find me. If you want to continue the conversation, you want to talk about anything business related, fine art development, coaching, sales, whatever, let me know. And we'll get together, Lois and Amethal. Thank you very much for doing this. Thank you for not giving up on the fair, even though it's all weird. I'm grateful and I miss you both in person. I miss everyone out there and I will be back next year, hopefully, if they'll have me to the real fair. Monica, thank you so much for being our very first presenter for our very first online workshops. Yay! It's been a pleasure to meet you. It's always a joy to see you and learn from you. Thank, Thank you. Monica. Thank you. Okay. I appreciate that. Thank you, everybody. And as soon as we get the link, we'll make this available on YouTube live, or I guess YouTube, so you can play back and watch and rewatch it. All right, everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Uh, Happy For Saturday. Those of you are interested at 3:30, we have our second workshop. It's going to be Stephen Bay, and he'll be talking about landscape photography and astrophotography. So, we hope to see you back at 3:30. All right, bye everybody. Have a great weekend. Thanks, Monica. Bye, Monica. Thanks, everybody. Bye. bye.